I'd say now we're all good, all good to go. And thank, thank you very, thank you very much. We're now live across multiple uh, platforms, and we have some uh, amazing guests that are real experts on one of the big issues of the day in British politics, which is of course. Uh, the, of football. Usually it's on the back pages of newspapers, now it's on the front pages. There's many controversies regarding the, the beautiful game of late. Uh, clubs which are running deficits, breaching uh, UEFA fair play rules. There uh, are accusations that some clubs have been hosts to uh, illicit gambling, others uh, even perhaps potentially money laundering. Uh, the control of clubs is also an issue with the ownership and directors of some clubs being highly questionable and tarnishing the good name of the Premier League, which is one of the great brands of modern Britain. Indeed, clubs in the English Premier League are amongst the most successful, the biggest, most popular clubs around the world, and they're great ambassadors for Britain and her soft power. But of course, with that has come some lax rules and really failure to take on board the wishes of many fans, such as, as we've seen we have many years now with Manchester United and the Glaziers, and of course the efforts to create uh, a European Super League. Now, uh, Brexit Britain really isn't keen on a European Super League, and uh, that caused a great deal of problems. Many fans were deeply upset about how football is being divorced from its fan base. And out of that came the fan-led review and indeed a government white paper on where we take football next in this country. And to discuss this and many other topics to do with the game of association football, known to uh, some heretics and uh, Americans as soccer, we have Bob Lydon, who's an expert on finance, we have Dr. Rakib Essan, who is a writer who's wrote about this for um, uh, Politea, amongst other groups, as, as, well as, uh, as well as the other organisations he's also represented. And of course, Ariyaman Banerjee, apologies for my pronunciation, I don't you'll correct me later, who's wrote about this, also, this topic also for Civitas. So to start us off, um, we'll start with Ayara Man, who can also take this opportunity to connect, correct my awful pronunciation. No, thank you, Robert. Um, thank you for that introduction. Ayara Man is, is fine. Most people call me AB. So if you're more comfortable than that, then, then go with that. And, and thank you for, for having me today. Uh, it's always a great privilege to be able to speak about the, the governance of English football and particularly at such a critical moment with the white paper on the future of football being published just yesterday. And, and what I might, I thought might be best to do is run through what I found in my publication for Civitas, which came out last week, which looked at the fan-led review on which the white paper has been commissioned and explain some of my conclusions and compare them with what the government has now revealed. So I want to sort of go back to start here and, and, and the commissioning of the fan-led review and its publication in 2021. I mean, this is almost an unprecedented level of investigation into men's football launched by the government. And it, it does sort of beg the question, what makes this necessary? How did English football get to the point where the government was forced to launch an independent review of governance across the sport? And the answer, as you've sort of alluded to, really is twofold. In brief, at the point of the Family Red Abuse publication, English football had become stretched to a point that was unsustainable. On the one hand, we had an epidemic of football clubs reaching the point of liquidation, administration and technical insolvency. Uh, familiar names, of course, would be Bury FC, Macclesfield Town, Rushton and Diamonds, Chester City, but of, of clubs that no longer exist or are no longer operational. But the problem in truth is much deeper than that, or, or does in fact risk becoming much deeper. In 2019, 2020, 37 of the 72 clubs within the Football League, the three divisions below the Premier League, were registered as technically insolvent. We've seen how close to the sun clubs like Derby County and Bolton Wanderers have come to going under, and this risks being becoming a much more widespread problem. And then on the other end of the pyramid, uh, what we've gotten, again, you alluded to this, was the attempted formation of things such as the European Super League. Now, this risk creating the advent of closed shop elitism, detracting from everything English football stands for, the, 
idea that the beauty of English football is, the, is that any club for, from anywhere can reach the top of the profession with the right set of circumstances. And more than that, what this showed is the backlash against the competition caused by fans showed how isolated clubs have become from the ambitions of supporters and how isolated it's become from communities, which is what English football represents. English football is a hub for communities and that's what football clubs are. And so came the, the fan-led review with 47 recommendations and its breadth and range of issues which it covered were impressive. Everything from financial sustainability, which I'm sure Bob will know far more than, than I do, to, to player welfare, to supporter engagement and club heritage. And as we know, out of this, chief amongst this, came the suggestion that an independent regulator should be introduced. A sort of footballing quango to ensure good governance in the sport. And this, as I've described in my piece for Conservative Home, has been for a long time the ugly duckling of solutions. Nobody wants more regulation. Nobody wants football being run from Westminster. Nobody, and Steve Farris, chairman of Crystal Palace, pointed this out yesterday. Nobody wants to be the only major footballer nation where our competition is being run by the government. The costs, the threats, regulation, the very principle of it is, is almost obscene. But in this case, it may have just become the only option, at least in the short term. In fact, it's not the very idea of a regulator that should make us nervous, but the fact that a government's proposal is that such a regulator would be indefinite, that the future, no matter what, will see this form of regulation. Now, it's quite clear to most football fans um, that some form of change is needed. We, we're currently in a wild west of corporate governance. Uh, firstly, we appear to be the only major footballing nation where the tail is able to effectively wag the dog. At the top of English football, we have and have had, had for a very, very long time an unsustainable competition for power between the traditional governing body of the sport, the FA, and the constituent leagues, the Premier League and the EFL. In 2009, a report by the All-Party Parliamentary Football Group on the governance of English football outlined the manner in which the Football Association, the Premier League and the EFL were continue, com continually competing for power and influence within the English footballing ecosystem. The report suggested that the FA should be uh, should regain its role as the leading governing body as the single voice and the overall regulator of the report. And whilst there should, in principle, be no issue with representation of various parties presenting individual ideas, the level of impasse between the FA, the EFL and the Premier League that has come into place since 1992 has been fairly catastrophic for men's football. And that is a point that needs to change. The, uh, the, the Premier League and the formation of the Premier League has been described as something that has represented something the FA has always opposed. And this has led to several unsuccessful attempts from the FA over the past 30 years to reinstate power. In the 1990s, for example, there was a proposal to reduce the size of the league to 18 clubs. 2004, uh, the Premier League fought back. They got four seats onto the FA board, giving them more influence to run English football. Um, and so whilst in theory, since the publication of that report in 2009, the FA's authority has been restored. In theory, the Premier League's website itself sees that the FA is the traditional uh, uh, is the traditional governing body of the sport and, and regulates everything. It's clear that in practicality, the phenomenon of these competing voices to reach satisfactory resolutions on key issues in English football has persisted. And the result of this has been a continued struggle, Robert, for stability. In 2020, for example, I mean, I'm sure I won't need to explain again to football fans, the Premier League's biggest club spearheaded an attempt to reform English football through Project Big Picture. In 2021, the Big Six were reported to be fighting off an owner's charter put forward by the Premier League that would commit them to qualifying for the Champions League on sporting merit. These impasses go on and on, and the ramifications of this lack of unity goes further. We've seen in the news the impasse on financial redistribution between the Premier League and the EFL becoming increasingly problematic. The current system whereby parachute payments, as they're called, are made across three years or two or three years by the Premier League to relegated clubs has been accused of distorting the competitive balance of the leagues below, causing clubs in the championship to spend excessively and beyond their means just to be able to compete. And it's been this that has been charged with causing the insolvency and liquidation of clubs across divisions, as owners gamble financially in order to attain on-field success with no plan B, should that not be achieved. In the meantime, the chairman of the EFL, Rick Parry, has been calling for an increase in 25% um, in solidarity payments, the payments made to the, uh, to the EFL by the Premier League, which are split between the 72 clubs. The Premier League have remained sort of unmoved on that. Um, 
And this has all become exacerbated by the current crop of owners present in English football. In terms of the financial sustainability, we've got a set of owners in some cases where the checks are not, they don't uphold enough despite the fit and proper person's test. And we allow a culture of owner without that knowledge of the football industry. In 2004, a, the fit and proper person's test was first introduced for new football club owners, um, designed for the owners of any football club or whoever owns over 30% uh, of the club. However, from the outset, the test design was fundamentally weak. And all it requires to pass the test is for a prospective owner or director um, to overcome a very reasonable set of conditions, the main point of which are conflicts of interest with other clubs, being in the process of filing for bankruptcy or not having been director of a club, which have, uh, or two separate clubs even, which have previously gone insolvent. Obviously, it's very, very easy to, to sort of pass. I could pass that test. Um, and we've seen this most notably at, at clubs like, like Portsmouth, who between 2005 and 2013 had five different owners, including Eastern European conmen, businessmen with a pension for, for stealing money from their wives and, and property tycoons without any money at all. Um, but Portsmouth were, were eventually sort of bailed out and there are more tragic examples of this. Barry FC, for example, is the most notable, where Steve Dale was handed ownership of the club without the requisite money to be able to pay off wages or debt to HMRC. And what we see as well is it's not just the case of new owners. People who have been in charge of clubs for years and years because there is no follow-up checks on these panel-led reviews, on these, um, on these fit and proper persons tests mean that if a person becomes unsuitable over time, as was the case of Mr. al Qadi at Macclesfield Town, who for 15 years provided solid investment and then effectively ran out of money uh, to, 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 to pay back debts, there is no check and balance to highlight a red flag that this person should no longer be in charge of this football club. And one of the byproducts of this inappropriate ownership structure has been a lack of supporter engagement and supporters becoming increasingly isolated from the club that they love. And this was best seen, of course, through the attempted formation of the European Super League, but also in more sort of granular levels. During the 2020-2021 season, for example, Oldham Athletic experienced what was described as a complete breakdown in communications and relationships between supporters, supporters and ownership, when the club owner, our gentleman's name is Abdullah Lems Gazim, failed to deliver on several promises made to supporters and actually just banned three supporters from the stadium for promoting dislike of his regime. Birmingham City earlier this season as well became heavily criticised for a lack of transparency with local stakeholders over the club's, uh, over the club's most recent ownership crisis. That got into Westminster, that got into Parliament. Um, these are two examples. I mean, the list is endless. I mean, I was listening to Action for Albion uh, earlier, the, the West Bromwich Albion fan group are incredibly upset with their owner sucking money out of their football club. That's £9 million Mr Guan Chang now owes to West Brom. And these issues, whilst perhaps the most seminal, very much only scratch the surface. Football is sort of laden with a host of other problems, such as unregulated cryptocurrency that has seen fraudulent companies take advantage of clubs and fans, conflicts of interest, or the Premier League are forced to regulate themselves, um, and um, which means sanctions are light. And as you alluded to, the case in the Premier League's latest investigation of Manchester City, where the findings were, were timed to demonstrate the robustness of the Premier League's process. In fact, all that shows is how clubs are allegedly, allegedly able to manipulate the market so freely across a number of seasons. Now, I realise that I've spent quite a long time painting quite a bleak picture in terms of the outlook for English football. I don't think that we are necessarily all doomed. This is not the end. English football can recover. But it is of vital importance now that we get the method of recovery right, that we toe the line between the need for some form of change and excessive interference into a unique market which has a cultural place in English society. An independent regulator on the surface is not a bad idea to help facilitate getting English football's house in order. If a regulator can, in the short term, so solve some of the more pressing issues um, within English football, such as a new fit and proper person's test, supporter representation at boardroom level, fairer financial redistribution, an end to nefarious cryptocurrency companies intent on fleecing pockets of fans, then we will have got to a place where English football has failed to get to over the past number of seasons. But the idea that this should be an indefinite solution is a worrying one. In response to the findings of the family-led review, the Football Association called to be given more power to be able to regulate themselves rather than hand it to an independent regulator. 
Uh, in theory, this should be the, the ideal scenario. We want to, the traditional governing body of English football to be able to effectively regulate the game, not Westminster. But in reality, given the power of the Premier League and the EFL, what we've seen is that struggle for power over the last two decades is the FA being muscled out of the driving seat consistently to the point where it has been the Premier League in the EFL with more power to make change. And that's something that's been alluded to by the Football Supporters Association and a lot of other stakeholders. What we therefore need, and my report for Civitas highlights this in detail, is a regulator whose primary job is to reinforce and restore the power of the FA. A regulator who's focused on modernizing the FA's processes and give it a stronger voice when competing with, as you say, huge brands such as the Premier League, particularly at a time when super clubs are on the rise. Any regulator, therefore, should look to have a sunset clause by which point this should be enabled. The issue we have now is that the future of English football has been tied to regulation. The fan-led review and the government's white paper seem intent on ensuring that the FA should never have power and to confine English football to an era of red tape. In terms of the actual aims of the regulator, some are very encouraging. The, the idea of a new uh, and more robust fit and proper persons test is a sound one, protecting club heritage, which is bad with name. Um, and my report for Civitas makes 17 recommendations on this. Some of these, as I've just mentioned, agree with the uh, agree with the regulator's aims. Some need refinement and some, for example, the idea of a blanket transfer levy on, on Premier League clubs are, are, simply, are simply bizarre from the regulator's point of view. Um, but my main worry is away from the minutiae of the fan led review of the, one, or the white paper, it is on a wider level and how the focus is too much on what a regulator can bring to club level and not on uh, as much on what it can bring to a wider governance level. The measures laid out by the white paper should not have to be implemented by a regulator. Like everywhere else, it must be done by the governing body of the, of the, of the game, the Football Association, even if the regulation in the short term needs to help facilitate that, which is what its role should be. The fact that this isn't even on the table is something that concerns me and leaves English football on the precipice of uncertainty. We need to get this right. But in order to do that, we need to think more critically. And that's my two pence. Sorry, I know I've spoken for quite a long time. Uh, Robert, you're, you're muted. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, AB. That was um, superb. And I know you've done a great deal of work on this on, on Civitas. And very much for your career to looking at football. Uh, before we go on to the um, panel discussion, of course, we'll have our other, other two speakers, uh, the first of which will be Bob Lydon, who, of course, as I mentioned, is an expert on, on finances. Uh, he's an experienced management consultant, both privately and with PricewaterhouseCoopers, and a specialisation in banking and payments. He's also published numerous papers about financial mechanisms in the EU, uh, through the Bruges Group, Politea and Global Britain. And of course, as well as being a finance uh, expert, he looks at football as well. And the uh, very awful case, really, that uh, many Premier League and other league clubs find themselves in. And of course, he's wrote about uh, who will drain the swamp of English professional football. And we'll be talking about this further to us now. Bob. Yes, thank you very much, Robert. Well, I don't think this, um, the white paper takes back control because I, my belief is the hijackers are still running the plane. They're still in the driver's seat. To me, the, the white paper is like a penalty shootout where it's nil nil and each side has had five shots. You know, they had an open goal here, the government, five, ten shots at it, and then they've all missed. But I'm just going to pick out six, six main points. Firstly, it's not retrospective. Secondly, there seems to be an awareness of the measures available to combat financial crime. But the way they're mentioned in the report implies their implementation would just be half-baked in this case. There's a failure to capture the global dimensions of these businesses that have the now the premiership clubs, these are global businesses. And there's a failure to set English football in the global context of the rich and the powerful. In fact, from what I can see, poor practice is the norm. You know, we, the, the report bangs on about reckless decisions. Well, how do you isolate a reckless decision that's out of the ordinary when idiocy is the norm? And lastly, 
what happens when a club fails the licensing? It goes bust, it can't play, it goes bust. So that precipitates exactly what we're looking to avoid. Those are the headings. Firstly, it's not retrospective. This is my first point. The uh, tests will only be applied to prospective owners of direct and directors. Incumbent owners will only have to notify changes. How many clubs believe that their current owner is a fit custodian of what's of their club? To me, they should be they, and I mean, it's quite a wide range of people should be put through the whole anti-money laundering sheep dip now as the first step to see how many pass and how many fail. And that takes me on to the measures for combating financial crime, because these measures are already available, not through the clubs, but through the banks, accountants, estate agents, lawyers who serve them, who are all so-called obliged entities under anti-money laundering legislation. Now we have tests like ultimate beneficial owner. It has to be declared. No, no, that's not the test. They have to come into the office with their passport, gas bill, electricity bill, council tax bill, and go through personal identification. Just and declaring them, that achieves nothing. We have the concept of a pet politically exposed person. That's not just about political affiliation. You know, one of the big six clubs, there could be 100 or 200 people who would classify as a pet politically exposed person if it was left to somebody like me to define that and put them all through the, uh, the test. It's not just the owner. It's not just the emir of wherever the top man the president it's the entire family agents middlemen hundreds of them and finally enhanced due diligence it's not just about source of wealth it's about an awful lot more than that so the way these concepts are mentioned they are mentioned but they're mentioned in about a 20th of their actual import and scope then Let's go on to the failure to set English football in a global context of the rich and the powerful. Where's the word sport washing? Are we not aware that the Premier League, that English football, has been subjected to the most gargantuan sport washing operation? There's no mention at all of club ownership being perhaps the first landing point of a foreign potentate it's part and parcel of obtaining UK citizenship. This is a hop, skip and a jump. Club ownership, UK citizenship for the owner, UK citizenship for the family. Wealth then moves across from wherever it was obtained and however it was obtained. Um, and one of the main things in sport washing and getting UK citizenship is getting the ring fence of the UK legal system around whatever and however that wealth has been obtained. Um, the English football has become an absolute central point in gaining that landing point. In addition, next one, failure to capture global dimensions of revenues and costs. So, okay, we see all the costs landing in the UK because that's all right. They're all tax deductible, including interest on owner loans. That should not be tax deductible. That was a big issue at Derby. There were all sorts of disguised loans through intermediaries, not directly from the owner, but through two or three layers of intermediaries. But where do the, the revenues land? For example, you know, if in IT, if you're somebody like Amazon or Google, all your licenses and intellectual property are vested in Ireland or Luxembourg, Panama sunny places with shady people as it's known in the trade and who's to say where all the revenues for shirt sponsorship and image sponsorship land because i bet pounds to a penny they don't land in the club in england so there's a myopia in this thing as to the dimensions of revenue where those land in the extended ecosystem that each of these clubs is 
And I mentioned poor practice is the norm because the whole structure is rife with the usual boring paraphernalia of tax havens, shell companies, corporate secrecy, nominee directors, layer upon layer of non-natural persons. What I mean is you, you and I and all of us, we are natural persons, but you can insert layers of trusts, partnerships, heaven knows what, in between the usual paraphernalia. And in all of that, what's normal? Do we, the fans, do fans think that is normal behaviour, that their club is owned through Panama and Belize and heaven knows where? Is that normal? But that's the norm. So what counts as reckless? What's going to stick out such that the regulator will say, oh, that's not normal in all of that? And what's the end state we're looking at? You know, if they, there is no end state, if this licensing system comes up, what is football supposed to look like 15 years out? Does it look pretty much the same as it does today? Because if you don't do anything about what's happening now, what's happened in the past, and just say we just test prospective owners, prospective directors, and only owners have to say something's changed, well, then nothing changes, except every now and again. And I noticed with quite a smile how there was a bit in the uh, thing in 4.9 of the white paper. Oh, we might have a particularly difficult regime for a newly promoted Premier League club with high costs funded through owner subsidies. That's my team, Nottingham Forest. Hyperlink to the Forest Annual Report. Yeah, if we don't stay up, this club could be done. You know, they've made such, taken such a risk what happens there? Do they lose their, would they lose their license? Then forests go out of existence. Well, that's a licensing system. If you lose your license, you, f you f go flat on your face, which is supposedly what this licensing system is meant to avoid. So I don't see where any of this goes. I find it, as with so much, so depressing to see an apparent minuscule awareness of things like ultimate beneficial ownership about enhanced due diligence, but actually the warhead on which the, the, this is mounted has got nothing in it. It's got an ounce of gunpowder and actually the plane has been hijacked. Don't we want to get the hijackers off the plane now and not just say, oh, we can't have any more in? Or, well, they can come in as long as they're not, they've got this size of grenade and if any grenade up to this size that can come in any uh, 0.22 rifle they can bring on but not a 303 is that is that it because what i do now right now i've set up an anti-money laundering task force I identify all the current service providers to the premier league accountants estate agents lawyers banks and i'd go through their anti-money laundering due diligence for the last 10 years on every single club that's been in the Premier League after the, over the last 10 years. I'd put in a whistleblower hotline and I'd have to have some kind of uh, immunity, some kind of permanently valid immunity from these lawsuits where the rich and powerful try to suppress stories that put them in a bad light. So we actually need a task force now to do what should have been done before the white paper, which is because the powers exist, no laws need to be put through, existing obliged entities that service the Premier League and have done so for the last 10 years need to go through the sheet bit and we will see who turns up on this side of the pages. They are fit and proper, or there, there's nothing adverse is known. And the ones over this side, oh, whoops, we wonder whether they should be involved. So that's what I do. I think the whole thing's extremely disappointing. A lot of hullabaloo and actually primed to fail, designed to fail. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Bob, for that uh, excellent speech, which of course shows us the dreadful situation that many clubs are indeed in. Our next speaker, before we go towards our panel discussion, is of course Dr. Rahib 
Rakib Etan. Uh, Rakib is an independent academic and culture writer specialising in matters of social cohesion, democratic governance and public security. Rakib holds a BA in politics and international relations, first class honours, uh, an MSc in democracy, politics and governance, passed with distinction, and a PhD in political science, all obtained from Royal Holloway University of London. So a really first class academic. Uh, on behalf of Think Tank for Best Publica uh, and the For Fans 2 campaign, Rakib authored the report, Playing by the Rules, the Governance of English Football. The report makes a case for an independent regulator for English football, which prioritises financial sustainability and social responsibility, as well as ensuring that supporters have a greater say in the game, especially over matters of club identity and heritage. And heritage is one of the key issues, because if a club goes under, over more than 100 years of heritage can be lost. The lifeblood of a community can indeed cease overnight if a licence is lost, or of course a club uh, is of course um, no longer functioning. So our next speaker, uh, Dr. Esan Rakib. Well, firstly, Robert, thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. And thank you for organising this webinar, uh, by the way. It's, it's very much a hot topic in our politics. And I just thought I'll, I'll touch on some of the points that have been made by Aryaman and uh, Bob. Uh, there's no doubt for me that the, one of the main points that I'll make in my report is that it, the, the current uh, system of self-governance in English football is not fit for purpose. Uh, I, I think that when you look at, for example, existing owners and directors tests, Aryaman touched on that, they're just simply not stringent enough uh, at all. Uh, whether or not he'd be allowed to own a football club is a different matter, but it, for me, it, it definitely not robust enough for my liking. But then Bob makes a very important point, the lack of retrospection, which is contained in the white paper. So I, th I think that that's an element um, of this proposed legislation that the government really has to build upon. How does it approach incumbent club owners who are clearly running their clubs uh, in, a, in an unsustainable manner? Um, there's a great deal of emphasis on how it handles that process when it comes to prospective owners. But if, if there's an existing owner a director in place who are perhaps not uh, acting in the interests of financial sustainability or indeed social responsibility, they really need to flesh out how they're going to manage those kind of situations. So I completely agree with Bob um, on that front. I think that, you know, many of the technical aspects were covered by Bob exceptionally well um, uh, and Aryaman as well. I think what I'd like to talk about more is my uh, personal experience of my local hometown club, which is Luton Town uh, Football Club, the Hatters, which is the oldest professional club in southern England, by the way. And I think in a sense, it, it, Luton has it, it's, it's gone through a very tumultuous period, but now it's established itself as a, as a, as a, as a quite secure uh, community-oriented championship outfit now. Crucially, one place above Watford as well, which is, which is just as important as being in the playoff places. But I think what I'd really talk about is the fact that football, in a sense, because I've seen some... <laughs> seen some very questionable commentary since the white paper came out. Uh, I've seen some writers compare football clubs to water supplies and energy providers. Uh, I'm not sure if they're looking forward to Thames Water versus uh, NPower in the weekend, but those kind of comparisons I'm not too sure about. But, but for me, for, uh, football clubs across the country, especially in smaller sized uh, provincial towns, post-industrial communities, as you say, they're the lifeblood of those communities families and communities supporting their local football club, which provides a deep sense of meaning and purpose across the generations. And I think that's where we do, where I personally feel that the existing system of self-regulation, uh, the, the argument that the free market will account for the more social elements of what we're discussing, I do question that. And I think that was very interesting then the white paper. Now you have a conservative government openly saying the free market is simply not going to deliver when it comes to understanding the social value and the civic meaning of, of local football clubs. And as we, we've already talked about the experience of uh, Berry FC being expelled from the English Football League back in um, or 2019, the winding up of Macclesfield Town by the High Court the following year. Uh, th th these kind of um, 
episodes, they can cause a great deal of trauma in those kind of communities. And I think it's really important to make that point. I, I think that when you're looking at football clubs, I describe them as potential anchor institutions. Uh, the government talks a great deal about levelling up. I think a lot of people don't know, don't have a clue what levelling up really means or what, you know, what's the substance behind it. And, and I think that was a missed point, actually, in the white paper. It didn't even talk much about levelling up and the potential role that football clubs can play, especially if the government better coordinates with um, football charities and foundations how that can actually help to lift educational standards, boost employment prospects, um, heighten health aware, uh, health related awareness. And indeed in Luton, for example, my, my local club is involved in, you know, try, trying to get young people away from gang related activity. So it's a sort of a, a, a anti-crime prevention measures. And I, th I think that that's where th there is real value in that sense, in an independent regulator, which promotes a culture of financial sustainability, social responsibility and cultural and the protection of cultural heritage. I think that's where I do see the value um, of having an independent regulator for English football. But naturally, it needs to be very well designed. It needs it needs to be very carefully crafted. And I think that um, my, my, my two fellow panelists have made those points exceptionally well. Uh, I, I was actually a bit alarmed by the, the length of the white paper, actually. I found it to be quite a short document. I think in those critical areas, it doesn't go in depth. It, does, it doesn't go into the nitty gritty of it. Um, and, and, and in some cases as well, I actually find that the, certain things that are left out of the regulator's immediate remit, a remit are a crying shame. Now, a lot, a lot of conservatives are very critical about modern day equality, diversity and inclusion. But I do feel, for example, when you're talking about significant bar barriers of participation, Robert, I still don't think we have the most disability friendly game in the country. And I think that's something that should have been talked about. Um, and that's something that should actually fall under the independent regulators remit. Um, we're in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Where's the, there should have been more about how do we um, encourage clubs to think carefully about match day experiences to in, in order for them to be more accessible for working class fans who are really feeling the pinch in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Um, and actually, that would have helped the Conservative government to really reconnect with working class Brexit land. You're talking about Brexit Britain not being in favour of the European Super League. Um, they weren't very much in favour of the Liz Truss experiment either, which lasted 45 days. So actually, the white paper would have really presented, a, it presents a golden opportunity for the Conservative government to almost cultivate this whole wholesome, uplifting conservatism, talk about sustainability, responsibility, duty, protection. And I just feel that those themes were very poorly presented, actually, in the white paper. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna rattle on too much, but I think my, my general view is, I, I do think we have to move towards the creation of an independent regulator for English football because of, because of the, those very problems that we see when it comes to that fragmented and quite frankly, dysfunctional system of self-regulation that we, ha we, we we've currently uh, have in place, um, which have let down many working class communities across the country. But the government also has to think very carefully and not be too proud of this white paper. There's still a great deal of work to be done. Thank you, Rakeem. So really, we're seeing this white paper as a missed opportunity. Not, it's not tackling the real uh, problems about ownership, uh, the current owners. It's not addressing uh, protecting fans from clubs which, you know, in a sense, are monopolies. It's uh, you, you don't have a choice in, in many occasions to go and support a different different team. If you're from Luton, for instance, you're stuck supporting the Hatters, or or indeed, um, if you're from Manchester, you may be supporting Manchester City, and it's not the dumb thing to go and support Manchester United, which of course the fans there are deeply uh, unhappy about how they've been treated by the Glaziers, how uh, the Glaziers um, came in bought the club, put the debt onto the company. And so they're one of the biggest uh, clubs in the world, if not the biggest for, for a time, then became deeply indebted. And we saw Old Trafford as a, uh, as a, as a team, as, as, a, as, a, as a ground rather, which was state of the art, and has now been left in such a state that it's in need of 
some argue, redevelopment, as is uh, the, the local community, uh, uh, where, of course, there need, needs investment, all of which have been neglected by, by the Glaziers. For instance, just to, just to point them out as to uh, some of the most notorious owners of a club, but uh, they're not alone. Uh, there's, of course, indeed, there may indeed be many that are much worse and indeed some elements that are criminal. But do, do the panel agree that the, the white papers, the, the right thing to do, there needs to be a regulator, but it just needs teeth and needs to focus on real issues uh, and make sure they can actually have a, have a real impact. And of course, also, to what degree is there a free market when there's actually uh, in a sense, the clubs operate as a cartel. One could argue the Premier League is a, is a kind of cartel. Uh, they, they get the, the lion's share of t- television money, which is largely going coming from just a small number of, uh, of, of bidders. You know, to what degree is there actually a free market in terms of this, when one has to support the team that you belong to, that you've always supported, and that, that's prominent in your local area, and how much of uh, is football, uh, this football regulator, a missed opportunity? Who, who would like to start us off, Raki? Yeah, I mean, I think there was one point that I'd really like to make is that I think football supporters they 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 have to be realistic when it comes to their own expectations. Um, their football supporters across the some football supporters across the country, they've talked a great deal about oh my club has overspent. It's it's been spending it's been spending money in a in a in a deeply reckless fashion and all the rest of it. I, I think it's really important that f- football supporters they're realistic about their own expectations for their own football club. I, I have a, a young fans in my town. They're dreaming about Luton being in the Premier League. They're like, come on, they should be really ambitious. Could you imagine Premier League football being at Kenilworth Road or the, you know, in the future, the new uh, stadium at Power Court? And I think in a way I say, well, that'd be very nice, but Luton has to do that in a very financially sustainable way, which to be fair, under this current leadership, it does quite well. Um, Considering with, you know, spending in in a fairly prudent way, that they're, they're, they're positioned very well in the championship at the moment. But but I think that along with that promotion of financial sustainability, I think that football supporters in themselves, they have to take upon themselves to value financial stability themselves. Because I think that naturally, if football supporters, if they're desperate for success, which is understandable, then that, in a sense, might encourage an owner to say, listen, I need to make some immediate industrial scale investment here because the supporters are putting pressure on me and I'm deeply keen to deliver success. So I think the independent regulator, that is where it can come into play because it has those, if it has an expectation where club owners and directors, they have to regularly submit financial sustainability plans, that can help to be a check and balance. But on top of that, football fans as well have to have very realistic expectations. And I think in a way, if there's greater, for example, if there's greater supporters representation on club boards, um, I don't necessarily think that owners and directors should see that as a threat to their authority. Actually, it's an opportunity for them to say, well, actually, these are the pressures that we're under. This is why we have to do things a certain way in a sustainable and responsible fashion. So in a sense, if there's a, for example, a, a fans representative on the board, that presents an avenue for owners and directors to manage and moderate expectations of fans. So in a way, that sort of principle of reciprocity and mutual understanding, that can help to inform how we reform football governance, as opposed to seeing it um, as a, as a zero sum transaction. No, um, I think Rakib's um, uh, completely correct on, on sort of sort of all of these points. And there are just a couple of things I'd like to pick up on on your initial question and also some of the, the, the previous points made, um, Robert. Um, firstly, um, it, it was incredibly surprising to me when, um, and Bob and Rakib are both completely correct in, in saying that there's a lack of um, retrospectiveness um, in, in the owners and directors. Says, and that was incredibly surprising to me in the white paper, given that the fan, that is one of the things that the fan led review did sort of stipulate that there should be a retrospective nature to the new owners and directors test. And also it, it almost seems like the government have come in here and picked and chosen 
bits from the fan-led review which are least offensive to them and this idea of uh of of, of being retrospective with regards to that owners and directors test is, is not something that that they've picked up on particularly highly and something that they've it's a gaping hole that they've missed and i think in addition to that rakib raised a really really good point when he talked about social responsibility and civic responsibility now it's all very well us talking about the financial um sustainability and financial feasibility of new owners and, 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 and current owners. But there also needs to come a point where with football clubs, and as Rakeep said, this isn't NPower, this isn't British Gas, whatever. Um, football clubs as stalwarts of local communities, as community hubs, as pillars of British society need to be run by people with a legitimate, clean background with a ambition of good corporate responsibility and there are two examples that I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on which are um, sort of a little bit more alarming the first one is Blackpool FC and Owen Oyston and everything that happened in that club uh, between 1996 and 1999 in particular but but since then when Oyston was effectively um, running it from his um, from his prison cell and and then there, there's the, the other one that sprang, sprang to mind was a, an owner like Vincent Tan at Cardiff City who changed the club kit because red was his favourite colour despite Cardiff having played in blue for over 100 years. But even on a sort of more granular level, we look at what's happening at West Bromwich Albion with Mr Lai Wong Chan, where taking £9 million out of that business in his construction background is not a, a huge deal moving it from one business to another. He is, of course, the owner of both. But in this case, because the stakeholders are so ingrainly involved within the football club, because it is part of the community, they need to know when that money is coming back. They need to know how it's coming back. Will it be come back in time for the January transfer window? And what Mr. Guan Chang has done there is fail to understand the intricacies of the British football system. He's failed to understand what a pillar of the community this club is and how invested these stakeholders are. That's the first point I've sort of make on the owners and directors test. I think the second point you made, uh, Robert, on, on the need for regulator is something, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but something that I've obviously talked about at length in my Civitas paper. Yes, we do need a regulator, but I struggle with the idea that the regulator should be indefinite. I think the main point of the regulator should be to facilitate power to the Football Association, which is, of course, their initial reaction to the uh, to the fan led reviews publication. But I don't think anybody can feasibly dispute at the moment that the Football Association is simply not strong enough to govern English football. What we, one of the primary objectives of the regulator should be to modernise the FA's processes to the point where it is no longer being muscled out by the Premier League and by um, by institutions like the AFL. And, and the final thing I'll say on this is just picking up on Rakib's um, final point on, on, the, on the idea of, of supporter engagement. I think it, it would be so much better, and this is maybe idealistic of me, if clubs were to look at supporter engagement, and not enough clubs do this, as a new revenue stream, as, a, as, a, um, as, as this idea that engaging better with supporters, giving supporters more representation, will in the long term create an increase in revenue, more fans in the stadium, more investments in merchandise, all of that so all of that sort of thing. And that's not done enough. There doesn't seem to be this idea of critical thought that yes, in the short term, we may need to invest on giving support or representation a representation at boardroom level. But in the long term, and I spoke to one football league club chairman about this, who I'll, who I'll keep anonymous, in the long term, there needs to be that idea that there will be a payback here, because that is what and it comes back to it again, that is what the value of British clubs are to communities. And there will be a long-term payback to representing that sport engagement. So like Rakeem said, it's definitely not something club owners should fear. It's definitely not something they should feel threatened by. It should actually be seen as an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, your thoughts, Bob? If you unmute yourself, Bob. Yes, here we are. Yes. Just when I read the uh, press release yesterday about the white paper, I think the government minister, you know, the first line was something about football being one of Britain's great cultural exports. And I thought, wait a minute, if somebody came down from Mars and said, oh, I've heard about the football, what is it? 
Would you start off with saying it's a cultural export? No, to me that showed the an AB, you mentioned this, isolation, this displacement between the people in power, this elite of whom the club owners and directors are members. They're members of this global elite. And then there's the rest of us, the fans, all the stakeholders, the towns, the economies, and we are living on a different planet from those people. Why do we imagine that some process, however many people are involved, however many fans, when it's then offered up into that clique, that anything good's going to come out? You know, this is a like digital ID, like central bank digital currency, like Brexit, like all these good ideas in which people invest incredible amounts of time and effort, then they go into this machine at Westminster on what comes out. You know, because to me, this may as well not have happened. It was laughable. This is a, a one out of 10. Yeah, no, it's a nil out of 10 because we're still 10 penalties shot and they've all gone over the bar. This is not going to do anything. This is not going to take back control. What's the vision? You know, in management consulting, a much maligned profession as well, it's where are we now and where's actually where we've got to get to and how do we connect those two? What do we have to do along the way to get from this state to that state in a comprehensible way, in a way that will stick, will not fall apart? That's what you're trying to underpin. So we have no vision for it. We have no comprehensive and, and description of what state are we in now that the fans could relate to. This is where we are now. No, no BS, no polishing. That's where we are now. And there's where we need to get to. And how, here's how we're going to get there. We can't trust football ownership. So we're going to have a regulator get to get us from there to there. And on this year, we're going to solve that problem. Next year, we're going to solve this problem. Next year, that problem and so on. And along the way, we have several milestones. We check where we are. And if we need to alter, we do. But that's what we're going to get to. And I don't see any of that. It's a nil out of 10, naught out of 10 for me. Homework marked here, naught. <laughs> OK, Bob, what, what change in particular would you like to see? Well, I think it's to put the every club that's been in the Premier League in the past 20 years via the bankers and accountants, because this is already exists, to look at all the due diligence work, know your customer, know your customer's business, ultimate beneficial owner, all that. Go through all those files. Let's find the gaps. That will lead to a lot of fines because there won't have been proper work done. Once we've got the proper work done, how many of those people now are fit and proper? And then they go. They have to dip, disappear from any involvement in English football. And that's the first step. We remove. And if they are owners, their shares just have to get put into trust, a proper trust, not run by their uncle or somebody like that or one of their partners. They're, yes, what we need is, it's like uh, when the, the East Germany collapsed, all the industrial assets were put into the ownership of a, a trust called the Fiduciary Trust Company, Treuhandgesellschaft, and then they were sold off. So if that happened and, the, and an owner failed the tests, yes, the shares then get put into this Fiduciary Trust Company and then Perhaps the thing gets taken forward, but that person who's failed the tests is no longer involved. Clean the stables first. Just just about uh, a a b. What what about? Of course, you want to comment, but what about the Spanish model, where in some instances fans are actually firmly in control of their clubs in terms of electing who's in charge? Um, I'd like your views on that as well as um, your other comments. Yeah, well, um, no, that, that's that's a very interesting point. I think if you look at the football supporter uh, supporters associations sort of pyramid of um, of supporter engagement at, at the very top, they've got 
a more advanced version of that, which is the community owned club. Currently, we, we have three of those uh, in the in the in the English Football League, AFC Wimbledon, Exeter City and, and Newport County also. Um, look, speak, 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 speaking to people about this and speaking to the FSA, it, it's, it's a very idealistic sort of scenario a very idealistic situation given the the scale of these clubs given get, uh, given the the monetary traction that you need to sort of take to, to take control i mean i mean we'd all love to have a say as part of that but i'm just not really sure how feasible that is in the modern market particularly where football is um being globalized and commercialized uh, ad nauseum where you've got situations where um the public investment fund with Mohammed bin Salman as the chair is taking over football clubs. How feasible a culture of club um of other club uh, fan owned clubs or, or or fans making the big calls at clubs is in, in the current market. I also, in terms of additional comments, want to pick up on uh something Bob said. Well, take take something Bob said and and, and sort of make more of an example out of it i mean bob's given this a zero out of ten uh which you know is i, I completely understand where he's where he's coming from even if i wouldn't rate it so lowly myself um but i think he's on on onto something really when we look at something and this is this is just an example of how much this white paper has missed we look at something a hot topic as financial redistribution which is a huge, huge deal currently within the English football system. This is one of the things on which rests how sustainable clubs can be financially going forward, right? I was alarmed reading the white paper, not the white paper, the fan-led review initially, in seeing that the recommendation there, and the recommendation which has subsequently been picked up by the white paper, is that this is a problem that footballing authorities can be left to sort out themselves. That is pretty much verbatim what it says in the fan-led review. Sorry, we've been trying that for 20, 30 years. No, no impasse. We need some form of middleman here. We need someone to be somebody to break the deadlock. We saw during the pandemic, it took 18 months to reach a deal, a pandemic deal for financial redistribution between the Premier League and the EFL. That's when clubs were metaphorically on the breadline right it this is this is not a sustainable way going forward and it's something which expanding on what bob said has been completely ignored completely missed it's not there it's and i i find that sort of sort of remarkable and sort of again disappointing in terms of the overall perspective of the of the white paper thank you uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I have to agree. I, th I think that um, Rick Parry, for example, he, he doesn't seem to think that the white paper is strong enough when it comes to those redistributive measures at all. Um, in, in my report for Respublica for fans too, I, I did suggest that one way um, of going about this is implementing a levy on broadcasting related income generated with, within the Premier League. Um, because I, I, I Bob, ultimately, if, if you're going to do if you're going to do this, if you're going to introduce an independent regulator, you better do it properly. That's the truth of it. If you're going to say, listen, I want to impose a new financial settlement for English football, then just come out and say it, because there's nothing worse than uh, uh, the, the half baked introduction of a new regulator will be disastrous. It, 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 it truly will be. You, you have to. I, I just feel like the government at the moment is not very firm in its convictions when it comes to this creation of this new independent regulator for English football. Now, you may well disagree with the idea of introducing a new independent regulator, but what, what, what's worrying for me is that I, I generally support of the view that it should be introduced. I, I, I don't necessarily trust the government, this particular government, to carry it out in an effective way, that that is actually my worry. And, and the white paper, okay, there's some encouraging elements. So Bob's given it a zero out of 10. I mean, he's a, he's a much stricter man than I am, but he has a point that there's, there's some glaring omissions. There's some fundamental weaknesses as well, especially uh, one issue that we're just simply not going to be able to avoid is, is sports washing. It's, it's simply something that this government can't avoid. Now, of course, that, that's going to involve um, this is very much a DCMS, uh, it's in the DCMS remit, 
but, but there has to be conversation with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in terms of how, how do you actually approach this issue of sports washing, um, especially with this Qatari bid into Manchester United. Now, if, the, if it's the government's view that as long as an investor respects the social responsibility requirements, which are enforced by a regulator, then come out and say it. If, if, they're, if they're absolutely happy with um, an investor who may have close ties to the Qatari state, who may have potentially even generated their wealth in a country which, safe to say, that their, their, their workers' rights um, are far from stellar and that there's very significant forms of la um, labour exploitation. But if they're of the view that ultimately they respect the regulations in our country and the norms, and that they they bring to the table you know, very um, uh, very comprehensive plans when it comes to social responsibility, contributing to the sort of sort of the, the well being of the local community, then the government has to make it clear. Government has to make it clear this is our position because it's not it's not an issue that's going to go away. Uh, Miguel Delaney of the Independent he, he's written a great deal about this. This is something that can't be avoided. Um, so so the, uh, the, the thing that worries me the most is that the government, it, it's almost adopted a very self-congratulatory spirit over the white paper. Mm -hmm. That's what worries me. I don't, I don't think they realise that there's some very serious issues here and they need to be discussed out in the open. And if they don't do that now, it's definitely going to rear its ugly head in the, in the future. There's, there's no two ways about it. I think that redistribution naturally has, it, it carries dirty connotations in conservative circles, but we have to be honest. Um, and this is something that Aryaman has made, he made this point very well. In terms of redistribution, you're not going to have meaningful redistribution, which helps to shore up financial sustainability across the pyramid and the grassroots through self-governance. It's just not going to happen. The, the issue is that that's actually should be at the heart of the new, new independent regulators activity. That's what it should be. So the government what it has to do, if, if it wants to create a new independent regulator for English football, they have to believe in it themselves. That's what it is, because government tends to make mistakes when it carries out things that may be publicly popular, but they don't believe in it themselves. Or dare I say, they don't actually understand the bread, bread and butter issues very well. And that's my main concern. I couldn't agree more. I totally agree with you. How much scope does the government have for, for meaningful reform? Uh, of course, no doubt there would possibly be legislation coming uh, in, in the future. Parliament have to have to vote on, on this, should there be time before uh, the next election. Uh, we'll see if, uh, if other political parties will take this forward. But we have in a sense, we, in terms of cases of Newcastle and uh, Manchester City, uh, Newcastle with, of course, um, uh, the, in a sense, the Saudi state, to some degree, owning that, that club, and Manchester City, the involvement of the United Arab Emirates, two uh, countries whose ruling families and um, uh, elites are very influential within the UK, exercise a lot of power uh, in terms of uh, DP World, they they had recently uh, made all the, all many of the stewards uh, P and O un, unemployed, uh, sacked them overnight, uh, exercised uh, some quite shameful business practices, and uh, they they all, all originate from a country which now owns Manchester City. Uh, uh, how how can we trust these uh, organised these 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 countries to do the right thing, and how can we be sure? that the government would and parliament would pass legislation uh, that would have a regulator that's strong enough when the links between our government uh, and of course those countries governments would are, are very close and indeed there may be pressure and lobbying for those changes to be watered down because after all in a sense some english premier league clubs are to some degree, state assets of the United Arab Emirates in terms of Manchester City and Newcastle in terms of Saudi Arabia. Of course, you can say there's Chinese walls in place, but these are uh, is public. It is um, you know state funds that have been partly purchasing those clubs, and it's caused a lot of problems uh, in terms of their those takeovers. They had to put measures in place because there's uh, disputes over over rights, but. There's going to be pressure from abroad because these are 
these clubs are private, publicly limited companies. There are shares are open on the on the market. In some degrees, they're owned by entities which are powerful countries. How how much scope does the government really have? Well, you know, I'll, shall I take that, Robert? Yeah. Um, if they haven't got any scope, why don't they just say so out loud? To say Saudi Arabia is an important regional ally in the fight against Islamic terrorism. They supply a lot of oil. We can't hack them off. You know, that is, these are vital national interests. And these are our friends in an unstable region. And we need them. And we can't afford to, you know. And to be up front, the Saudi wealth office, who is the ultimate beneficial owner of that? Is it? the Saudi people, in which case none of them need to go through an ultimate beneficial ownership test because none of them own more than 10%. Or is it the Saudi royal family that controls that? Um, you can, you know, flip a coin. And if you want to not do a UBO test, you say, oh, it's a wealth fund like the Norwegian wealth fund. But actually, other people would say, well, it's the Saudi royal family. This is a vehicle for their own charitable, philanthropic, whatever it is. And you just say out loud, well, actually, boys, there's nothing we can do about this. And this is just part of the modern world we live in. And you're going to have to suck it up. Say it, if that's so what the fans I agree with Rakib. I agree Again. very strongly with Rakib. He's absolutely right. There's so much that isn't said. There's so much that isn't said about the wider context in which this operates. And uh, to me, the, the government is a half-hearted, completely half-hearted, might be better to wait a couple of years because you generally get cross-party support for this type of thing, but it might be better put through by a different government. But then, you know, when they get into power and the foreign secretary comes in and says, well, actually, there's a lot more riding on this than just, you know, three points every Saturday afternoon. And they then decide, they're in the same boat, but what's out there smacks of being half-hearted. Okay. I, I couldn't agree more with Bob, and I, I think that I'll just I'll just create a dilemma right now off the top of my head. You have an owner who's closely connected to a state, a, a very wealthy owner who's closely connected to a state, which doesn't have the finest record when it comes to protecting the rights and freedoms of religious minorities in their country. The new owner comes in and says, I have this really ambitious plan of social responsibility where I want to create a more inclusive game in the town and have um, uh, Muslim minorities in your town or city to get them more involved in the game, more family friendly programs. So to create a more inclusive, multi-faith environment for, our, for the beautiful game in England. What does the regulator say? <laughs> is that person allowed to invest in the game or not are you going to be more focused on if they're closely connected to a particular state and what is going on in terms of potentially state sponsored discrimination towards particular groups in that society which could be on a totally different on a totally different continent or do you focus on what the investor is saying they're going to bring to the table in terms of trying to meet their social responsibilities, which are enforced and required by a potential new independent regulator. I'll just leave that there because that is going, that is going to be a that very is, serious sticking point. Yeah. Iron Man. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to disagree with, with what either of the other, other gentlemen have, have said here. I mean, what Rakib's just highlighted is the number of unanswered questions that we still have about the future. And this is what I touched on. There is still a lot of uncertainty. We have no idea with all these different scenarios how they could... Um, how they could transpire and what the regulator would would say, because we don't know. It, the white paper is so light that we don't know how that sort of thing would, would sort of pan out. I'm completely agreeing with Bob. We are in a very complex, increasingly globalised political world, and it may well just be the case that at times the government can't afford to prevent, to tick off states with which we are very reliant and 
maybe honesty is a slightly better policy there, but you know, on the caveat, it's it's not always politically prudent, which is which is why it doesn't happen. Uh, to, to come back to sports washing, um, how serious uh, is is this um, globally and, of course, within the Premier League? Um, I think it's massively, massively sort of serious. We're we're not just seeing it in, in football now. This is this is a new trend. It's in it's in vogue, very much. We see we, we see what's happened with the uh, LIV Golf Championship. Uh, not that I'm a huge follower of golf, but. Um, um but in in saudi arabia i mean this is and david goldblatt the noted sports historian has written extensively about this this is the modern way of showing soft power showing strength but also demonstrating to the world what a clean regime you have and how and how great your 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 country is and like you said right at the beginning of this webinar robert given the global brand of the premier league where better to do that than the premier league and we've seen that with Newcastle United. We've seen it with Manchester City, and we may well see it with Manchester United. And there's one, there's one thing I'd like to pick up in particular. And everybody talks about the soft power element of, of, of the Newcastle United takeover and the fact that it's been effectively owned by by the Saudi state with with some Chinese walls in there. I thought what was even more tragic than that is the way that during that takeover process, the historic community assets and remember to all intents and purposes newcastle is a one club city this is huge as, a, as an institution within the city of newcastle who are, you know incredible football heritage became an international political pawn in a dispute between via bein sports the qatari sports broadcaster and the saudi state which is one of the things holding up the takeover suddenly what we had there was a historic British community asset at the middle of a geopolitical battle thousands of miles away being used as a pawn on a chess piece on, on a chessboard to attempt to stop in, in a Qatari attempt to stop a Saudi takeover that's what we're dealing with for me the word I use is tragic how do we get to that point and the fact that we are at that point you know it pains me, and it should pain a lot of football fans. Okay. I, I, I couldn't agree more with Ayaman's point right there, that it, it's English football is running the risk of almost becoming a, it, it's, it's a, an imp, importation of geopolitical battlegrounds um, from the Middle East, which is absolutely remarkable, but that ultimately reflects how globalised the game of football is. Um, so the question is here, um, how would a new independent regulator go about that? Um, how, what does the UK government feel about it as well? At the moment, we're, we're very much none the wiser um, on that front. Uh, but but I, I look at it like this. So if you have um, th th this, uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound good to have an importation of geopolitical battlegrounds in English football. But then if you have um, two, mid uh, two owners from two different Middle Eastern countries in close, prox close, close proximity in terms of their ownership of a particular English football club, and the two of them compete for the hearts and minds of those local communities, especially through um, socially responsible schemes, whether that's to do with education, employment, health, um, anti-crime prevention measures, is that necessarily a bad thing? Is that necessarily a bad thing for England? So, but, but, the, but the point is, that's the kind of thing, those are the kind of trade-offs that we need to be talking about, right? Because we were ultimately having, we could have potential inv investors investing into our game who might be closely connected with states, um, who have values and principles who may be wildly divergent from our general social, political, and cultural norms. But if they respect the regulations and rules that we have in place in England, and they bring to the table um, ambitious schemes where uh, social responsibility rank, vi rank very highly up, of course, you, you would question their motives as to why they're doing that. That is ultimately what sports washing is, is, is all about. Mm -hmm. But what you have to think about here is, do we want our game to become, uh, or it, it, do we want the English game to become, um, defined almost especially especially in the premiership 
do, do you do you want that taking place almost that sort of competition between different Gulf states di different Middle Eastern states in terms of who can win the hearts and minds of communities or do you actually see that as a good good thing in terms of helping to lift those communities especially if they they fund their respective football charities and foundations really well but that's something that needs to be talked about in greater detail if I might draw an analogy I mean to me these community schemes you know it seems very much like the crumbs off the rich man's table. It's, oh, I can achieve sport washing in a prominent place in British society. But the price of that is a bit of, you know, community stuff, Birian. Oh, how much is that? Oh, well, you know, that's half a million oil revenues. Fine, go ahead, if that's what we've got to do. Or do we want to bake our own loaves of bread here ourselves? And okay, it may be that the loaves we bake are smaller than the crumbs. Is that okay? If, if we do our own thing, what's the potential of doing our own thing rather than having to live off the crumbs that come down from Saudi Arabia? But what sort of society do we want to live in? Uh, I, and I, and it's, I, all about, yeah. it's all about this, this white paper. It's mush, isn't it? It's a load of mush. OK, you've got community here and heritage there, but what sort of society, if football is that important, and it is because it's about the identification of individual people with where they are, where they're from, and it's part of their own self feeling of self-worth. Well, if we really believe that, I do, by the way, what does that say about the, the significance of football in the society five years ten years down the road and if there's something we have to give up to get there because those things that that brings are of great value perhaps not money just money but actually the direction we're traveling about in at the moment it is just all about money actually it's about status and power money status and power if that's the direction we're traveling in OK, then we're really done and all done. And this isn't going to do anything to stop that. If, on the other hand, we want to say, no, this isn't about money, status and power. Some money is needed, but the status, the people who should have status are the fans, the towns, the communities. That's who should have the status, not the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, not the emir or somebody. These are the people who have got the status. So that's where we've got to move to. And here's how where we are now, which is miles away from that and moving in the opposite direction. How do we turn the ship and how do we start to proceed to where we want to get to? Because this white paper is just mush, actually. It's, to me, it's like slush after snow. It's messy, damp, doesn't do anything for me. Again, naught out of ten. Um, you, you usually, though, in the UK, we would welcome uh, foreign direct investment. We you know, often yeah. see many British brands, uh, from Rolls Royce to, to Jaguar to Nestle, um, uh, or Bourneville. Many it isn't really a financial you know, investment, in British bank, is it? but it's many, not many a have... financial investment. Very little, nothing. Yes, all right. You get football comes out of it but it's not like you produce economic assets and there's a profit and there's an expansion it's it's not really in my view it's not really an investment it's like cryptocurrency people say that's an investment but if you think what the um characteristics are of an investment for the investor and the recipient of the investment this doesn't uh uh, really fit that because really the money it just comes in there's no limit to the amount of money that is needed no profit is ever made there's no corporation tax ever paid is there what are the corporation tax returns from the, the for, from the premier league over its lifetime they've all got tax loss carry forwards coming out of their ears and they require subsidies from whatever disguised from different places and conduits and that's part of the manchester city problem isn't it because the the subsidies are coming in according to the premier league or the ef or whoever 
from multiple different sources which are in the hands of the same controlling party. So they are not arm's length commercial deals. They are disguised subsidies because they're not contracted on the same terms that, that will be contracted by a completely independent investor. So, you know, it's not an investment. Well, what are they getting out of it? They're probably giving up money, but they're getting status and power. So that's the trade. There's a trade. And who is the loser? You know, you have to be very brutal. Who is the loser and in what quantity? And the loser over the last 20 years has been the fans, the communities. All of that has been the loser. And the, the ship needs to be turned first. And if you don't realise that the ship's pointing in the wrong direction, well, then you're never going to get in the right direction. If you don't even recognise what's gone wrong, you're never going to turn it around. Well, of course, um, some, some of those brands I mentioned, some had been saved by uh, foreign own owners coming in uh, others of yeah, well, look at the steel it's been just destroyed so they're with the with the factories closed down against uh, promises yeah. and look at us. jobs moved over overseas stealing. so it can be a double-edged sword indeed and of course the french would defend their culture and their heritage indeed they have special rules in place for the protection of their uh, their film industry for instance uh, and their protection of their their language and to many people in Britain, the football club is just as important as uh, as mm -hmm. cultural institutions are in France to, to, to the French. So, yeah, it, of course, clearly a lot of these investments, uh, we call them investments, but then they're, they're not really investments because it's people trying to buy access to the UK, uh, buy, buy a safe haven in terms of uh, if they were, for instance, you know, say, for instance, a, a Russian, re recent Russian oligarch who is now, um, from what I understand, departing the scene of uh, of, in of English football uh, to to other other emirs uh, or other other rulers uh, trying to uh, have have sports washing and uh, United Arab Emirates having involvement with Manchester City or the Saudis um, involving themselves with 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 Newcastle or, or other options. They're 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 not pure commercial decisions. There's they're approaching it not necessarily with 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 not necessarily with clean hands and ha have an agenda at work and <coughs> someone indeed may may lose from that. But who, who's going to be the biggest loser? Um, Rakeem. No, I, and and I, I, I I agree with me the points that Bob has made. I, I think that it's just it's just an issue that the UK government can't kick into long grass. It's it's it's, got, it's already rearing its head and um, a number of football journalists have made this very point about the white paper as well it just doesn't engage with those it, the, the, those critical issues of foreign ownership um, especially potential investors further down the line who might be closely connected um closely connected to states or indeed royal families where the sort of prevailing social and cultural norms are vastly different to ours um i i, I think that this is where the, the input of supporters will or should count for a lot actually um it, it, there'll be working class supporters who for example might be involved in the trade union movement how do they feel about their club being owned by um a, an investor who may well have close connections with the state where the workers rights are virtually non-existent so I, th I, th I think that that's where you do have the value of supporters having some kind of mechanism to say actually we're not happy with this for these for these various reasons equally the supporters say well okay we're not necessarily happy with this but then also when it comes to the, um, the plans for social responsibility it's something potentially that we can stomach and um, then the supporters uh, supporters groups also have the right to express that view but the point is they should be um somewhat involved in those discussions and they should be involved in that in in, the, in a consultative process because they certainly are, in my view, highly valued stakeholders, and all too often they haven't been treated that way under our existing system of self-governance, and that needs to change. Um, but, but you're right, this, this touches on matters of club heritage. A lot of our clubs, um, they're very closely connected to the trade union culture in those local communities as well. So and naturally that, will, that it opens up those debates to how willing supporters of those clubs 
are happy over their club being owned by a particular investor from a different country. So I think those points are really important to make, Robert. And I think the key is that the government doesn't shy away from them because at the end, they're, they're going to have no choice but to engage with them. Thank you. Before we go to our ear man, um, of course, the workers in Manchester went on, on strike uh, during uh, those that worked in the cotton industry uh, when, of course, they, they were the, the cotton the textiles that were being provided were made made from slavery. This is something they, they wouldn't tolerate, uh, particularly during the um, uh, American Civil War. Uh, of course, are, are they going to tolerate uh, the ownership of people from the UAE who may be less than less less less, less helpful towards uh, workers' rights than what they what they should be, perhaps? Um, a A B. Um, yeah, no, I very much agree with what, what the other gentleman said. I mean, there are just two two points I'd raise off the back of that. Uh, one is just an agreement that a lot of the time, I mean, not even a lot of the time, I would argue almost exclusively when states become involved, particularly from the Middle East, these are not commercial decisions. Let's be very clear about this. The Saudi Public Investment Fund do not need Newcastle United as an asset financially that's that's not the reason they're they're investing the other point what are they just, buying what are they sorry. really buying yeah, yeah exactly um the, the other point i just want to make is just to the back of what rakib was saying on the um on the idea of supporters getting a say i i do agree with rakib i think the, the only point i would make off the back of that is that it might when we get to that situation where we are asking supporters it might get slightly more complex slightly more nuanced because what we've seen in particular with all these clubs newcastle is perhaps the most recent example that we're going to see at manchester united is the different sets of supporters will all have different sort of varying opinions on how much they're willing to take if they're willing to have their club taken over by by a by a state backed enterprise or whether that's off the table for them, whether they'll uh, whether they will protest against that. And there will be all sorts of different voices. And my only worry with that with, and taking the voices of supporters or even supporter representatives um, as gospel is that there will be a lot of different gospels, more than four. So um, so um, it's something I think we will need to be careful of and, and an issue that could be could become quite pressing when that when that comes around. Um, just, just one quick point, because I know we, we sort of need, need to be sort of wrap, wrapping up soon, um, and because there's plenty more to be, be said. But say, for instance, putting a fan uh, or fans uh, representative on on the board, well, that's just, just one person surrounded by many, and no doubt surrounded by many um, high-powered lawyers and accountants and all manner of um, the best snake oil salesman money can buy and ha have, have indeed bought. What hope is there really for a fan led, a fan's representative being able to compete with those? And surely there's a danger that that, that fan and his, his representative organization will then be co opted uh, and brought in uh, and yeah. just sold the, sold, sold the story, uh, maybe, maybe paid off them themselves. Who, who knows? Is that, that, that doesn't really seem to be enough when, of course, you, he would be competing with the most expensive several thousand pound an hour lawyers uh, that, 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 uh, that, that, that have been obtained by, by the owner or owners of the club. If I could, um, if I could make more, I, I, I think that point about the, the risk of being co-opted, I, I think that is a valid point. But, but saying that, it's, it, 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 in my view at the moment, we simply don't have, um, how do you say, the, there have been recent times where supporters groups have very clearly been marginalised from very key decisions made by football clubs, uh, especially on sensitive matters of heritage and identity. I do understand that there is a risk that individuals can get co-opted. They themselves may be seduced by, seduced by the forces of power. It, it, it's perfectly plausible. There's also It's also perfectly plausible that if a fan's representative on the board feels like they're being excluded, or dare I say, not being treated well in a particular way, they may well report back to their supporters group and then lodge <laughs> a complaint to the new independent regulator and say that actually we suspect that we're being excluded and marginalised, and that even though we're actually represented on the board, we feel that there's not a, we're not um, we don't have sufficient sufficient participation when it comes to particular decisions. So in that sense, the independent regulator can act as a check. Mm. Of course, but also make the point that this particular individual should be democratically elected by the supporters trust 
And I'm sure that if there is a possibility yeah. that or there's rather there's a worry that they're being co-opted and they're not necessarily representing the majority of the bread and butter concerns of that supporters trust, and they can let that be known at the ballot box. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but I guess at the very least, they can say to the owner of um, Cardiff, you know, we're, we're not Swansea, we don't play in red, blue is our colour. Yeah, I mean, blue I is the colour, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just like, if, okay, if someone were to come in, say there's a new owner, and they said, I, I actually, I don't like orange very much, it doesn't suit Luton, they would, they, there, is, there is absolutely no way that the supporters trust would stand for that, because it's, it's just embedded in the town's history, in its heritage, mm. or if they wanted to take the hat off the, off of the oh, I don't like hats, so I want to take it off the crown. The country's, uh, the, the, the town's hat making manufacturing industry is still a source of civic pride. And, and I know that it sounds very trivial, but for football fans, those things count for a lot. Now, so, so I do make that, but I do agree with that point about being caught. But, but as I said, I think that this is where I talk about in my report for Respublica. There's that's has to be a, a democratisation within the game, it, it, and especially in, within internal club structures, where regularly, and, and I think I'd also make this point the fans' representative. They're also accountable to their supporters trust as well. They're, they're not there. They're ultimately there as a representative on behalf of that supporters trust who should be in the who should be democratically electing them to the club board. So, as I said, Robbie make a completely uh, decent point there about, you know, the possibility of being co-opted, not necessarily representing the supporters groups uh, majority interests at heart. But I'm sure that if they were to behave that way, they wouldn't last and they wouldn't last on the club board very long, would they? Oh, and, and of course they can also, you're absolutely right, that's a good good point, uh, uh, and of course they can also uh, object if the owner wants to put a statue of Michael Jackson outside the, the club, like what happened at, uh, at Fulham, Michael Jackson's great, but uh, <laughs> not uh, not necessarily... Um, not at Craven Cottage. No, 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 not necessarily with Craven Cottage, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, fi fi final comments, uh, who, who'd like to go first? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy to look. I, I think it's first of all, I, I think it's been an incredibly engaging discussion. Um, so thank you, Robert, for, for organising this, and, and, and thank you to to Bob and Rakib. Um, I think it can't be underestimated what a critical moment this should be for English football. It's taken a long, long time to 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 reach this point, and all the all the noises. And the level of in, uh, of intervention from the government were were looking promising. And like I said in my in my introductory remarks, we need to get this moment right. I am like Bob and like Rakib. I am skeptical of how right that the the direction proposed by the white paper is. Partly because there doesn't appear to be much of a direction. I think it's really is time to step up now and to 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 steal Bob's analogy. Um, we can't be missing penalties anymore because that would be a, a real crisis. Well, I agree with AB. I, I'm, I've said it. The, this gets a very low score. And um, it just fails to the phraseology, the, uh, the feeling of urgency is just not there at all. It, it just skirts around lots and lots of issues. And it is irritating that it should be launched with such a fanfare of self-congratulation. I just do wonder what happens next. I'm not holding my breath as we go into extra penalties, ad infinitum. <laughs> Raki, what did you think? Oh, no, I, I, I think that there's, there's significant room for improvement. When it, when it comes to this white paper, for sure. Um, it's no secret that I'm generally supportive of a creation of a new independent regulator, but I, I don't, I haven't quite reached the stage yet where I have a great deal of confidence in the government to deliver this in, a, in an effective way. I, I, and I also feel, I feel with the white paper, I, of course, you want to talk about the practicalities and the logistics, but I, I just thought there was an absence of philosophy behind it and I, and I think I think that is a problem I, I, I do want to see a little in, in when it comes to something as important as important as this you do want to see somewhat of this philosophical grounding when it yes. when it comes to reading that document and I think that's where I think this is where this government to be honest 
we've been through multiple prime ministers since the Conservatives won their handsome parliamentary majority back in December 2019. But that is where it suffers from. There's not that sense of, well, this is our philosophy. This is what is guiding us towards the creation of this independent regulator. Um, I thought there were some encouraging elements of the white paper talking about how the free market can't deliver this, especially understanding the social value of football clubs and all the rest of it. So in that sense, it was heading in the right direction, but in a very small way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that a lot of the things that we've discussed in this um, webinar that I've been delighted to be part of, Robert, and thank you for organising, by the yes. way, really. Um, I, I, I think that the government just has to, it has to stump up the courage and say, actually, this is what we believe in. This is what we think about sports, sports washing. You know, th this is what we think would make a good and proper custodian of a football club. It needs to flesh out those characteristics. It does. Um, in terms of, it needs to talk about these are acceptable sources of funding as well. It, it, it needs to get into the nitty gritty of that. Otherwise, what it's doing is leaving, of course, it's very difficult to explain the, these things. It's very difficult to approach them in a black and white manner. But in some cases, you're just going to have to. You're going to have. Because if you leave a gaping grey space in the middle, there, that is where regulation fails. That, that, that's the truth of it. If the design of it's not tight, if it's not well structured, and if it's not carefully crafted, going to run into some very serious problems. So the government, I, what I'd advise the government is to put aside this uh, era of self-congratulation, which they love to indulge in various areas of public policy, let's be absolutely honest, and actually say, OK, we may be, th th this is a decent start. But there's many issues that we have to consider very seriously and there's issues that we simply can't avoid and they need to be tackled as this white paper progresses over time. Thank you. That they are absolutely um, really informative comments and the discussion's been absolutely first class and I've been absolutely honoured and really pleased to uh, talk with, with yourselves and hopefully we will be taking this, this forward all of us will be no doubt in informing the political process and making sure this, this dire situation is, is improved. Uh, it's off to a start now. The, uh, the, the process has begun, may not have gone, begun as well as many would have liked, but it's underway now. And sometimes uh, movements uh, that once they start, they, they, they can't be stopped. Uh, the, the, the genie is out of the, um, the bottle, so to speak. We're, we're now, un now underway. And hopefully we'll have a more equitable situation going forward and a situation where football is properly run in this country and something we can be truly proud of uh, in terms of the, the business of the game, as well as how, how your teams perform on the pitch, which may, of course, be also a source of great frustration for many as well. Uh, and hopefully uh, the, the country will be, will be a lot better off because culture and heritage are, are, are important and football is absolutely fundamental to a lot of people's identity and, uh, and, and of course it's, it's great entertainment, but it's also much more than that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for all those, those listening across multiple platforms and we'll be sharing this and there's much more to come and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us.